Heute freuen wir uns, Silvia Federici aus New York und Melinda Cooper aus Sydney hier bei uns begrüßen zu können. Danke an euch, dass ihr von so weit her bei uns eingetroffen seid. Auf den ersten Blick beschäftigen sich beide Theoretikerinnen mit verschiedenen Themenfeldern und Spezialisierungen. Melinda Cooper forscht ebenfalls mit einem Theorieinstrumentarium feministischer und marxistischer Provenienz zur Entwicklung derjenigen biotechnologisch-ökonomischen Komplexe, die heute die Entwertsetzung und Kommerzialisierung des Körpers und des sogenannten Lebens vorantreiben, sei es in der Stammzell- oder Pharmaforschung, sei es in der Reproduktionsindustrie. Und sie interessiert sich dafür, wie hier neue Arbeits- und Ausbeutungsverhältnisse entstehen. Ihre Arbeiten haben in dem weit verzweigten und oft sehr detailverliebten Feld akademischer Forschung zu Biotechnologien die Frage der politischen Ökonomie auf die Tagesordnung gebracht. Zum Beispiel mit dem Buch Life as Surplus, Biotechnology and Capitalism in the Neoliberal Era von 2008, sowie auch im Rahmen ihrer Kooperation mit Catherine Walt B. Trotz dieser verschiedenen thematischen Interessen und Interventionsfelder, es gibt wichtige Überschneidungen in beiden Arbeiten, die wir gerne mit euch als zentrale Fragen gesellschaftlicher Arbeits- und Ausbeutungsverhältnisse diskutieren und in Verbindung miteinander bringen würden. Ich nenne da mal drei Punkte. Erstens äh, der Protest gegen die Unsichtbarkeit. Beide beschäftigt die Frage, wie sich das Verhältnis zwischen bezahlter und unbezahlter Arbeit in postfordistischen Verhältnissen verändert hat. Beide arbeiten aus dem Impetus heraus, gesellschaftliche Bereiche, in denen vor allem Frauen tätig sind äh, und die nicht der Norm formalisierter, vertraglich organisierter Erwerbsarbeit äh, entsprechen, als Arbeit zu benennen und damit gegen deren Unsichtbarkeit zu kämpfen. Sei es also zum Beispiel in der Pflege- oder Hausarbeit, sei es eben auch in der Arbeit der Eizellverkäuferin oder der Leihmutter. Zweitens die Frage der Gleichzeitigkeit. Beide thematisieren die Gleichzeitigkeit einer weiterhin unbezahlten, informellen und einer bezahlten, warenförmigen Seite von Arbeit. Etwa im Nebeneinander einer Reprivatisierung von Sorgearbeit, also zum Beispiel im Rahmen des, Abbaus von Sozialab also im Rahmen des Sozialabbaus und auf der anderen Seite eben auch eine gleichzeitige Zunahme bezahlter Sorgearbeit, wie sie an schlecht bezahlte, oft migrantische Hausangestellte outgesourced wird. Oder aber die Frage, wie altruistische Modelle der Spende, also der unbezahlten Spende von Körpermaterialien, heute mit Trends zur Kommerzialisierung etwa in der globalisierten Reproduktionsindustrie einhergehen. Als dritter Punkt noch das Festhalten am Begriff der reproduktiven Arbeit. Beide halten dafür mit unterschiedlichen Akzenten an dem Begriff der reproduktiven Arbeit fest und reiben sich gleichzeitig auch an diesem Begriff. Denn beiden geht es dabei nicht um die Analyse einer Essenz oder eines spezifischen Charakters von Frauenarbeit. Vielmehr geht es um einen konzeptuellen und politischen Zugang zu kapitalistischen Ausbeutungsverhältnissen, die eben nur in der Analyse des Verhältnisses zwischen bezahlter und unbezahlter Arbeit, auch mit dem Blick auf die vielfältigen Grauzonen, Überschneidungen und Verschiebungen zwischen beidem verständlich werden können. All right, um, the title of this paper is Transnational Markets in Assisted Reproductive Labor. Um, the work I'm presenting today forms part of a larger book project that I've been pursuing with my co-author, Catherine Wolby, um, and a recent research grant that I received from the Australian Research Council. Catherine Wolby and I have recently completed uh, the manuscript for a book called Clinical Labor, Tissue Donors and Research Subjects in the Global Bioeconomy, which should be coming out with Duke um, late 2012 or early 2013. Um, a book in which we attempt to analyze the contemporary biomedical economy from the point of view of various kinds of embodied, um, uh, embodied labor, extending from tissue extraction and assisted reproductive labor on the one hand um, to experimental labor on the other. What I mean by experimental labor is the work of people who participate in pharmaceutical clinical trials um, for money or in exchange for healthcare. We had both analyzed the contemporary biomedical uh, economy from the point of view of property and value, particularly the speculative valuation processes that have become crucial to the financing of biomedical innovation. Um, but it seemed to both of us that emerging conflicts around the ownership of tissues and the redistribution of the results of medical research 
could only be analyzed coherently from the point of view of uh, a labor relation. So we had both uh, come to a certain impasse in our respective research projects. Alongside this impetus was the fact that many forms of research participation and what is euphemistically referred to as tissue donation quite flagrantly operate as informal labor markets at the lowest levels of the United States economy. Taking part in phase one clinical trials or selling blood, eggs and sperm has always been an option for people who have few other immediate ways of making a living. There was also the fact that various forms of commercial gamete exchange and clinical experiment were beginning to be globalized in ways that were clearly enabled by the liberalization of trade in services under GATS, the General Agreement on Trade in Services most notably the trade in medical and health services. And it seemed to us that such processes could only be properly understood in relation to the general dynamics of transnational service labor. We began the project from this very contemporary point of view, but we both realized very quickly that there was a much longer history of clinical labor, dating back notably to the Second World War and the early years of Fordism. And we realized very quickly that the exceptional, literally marginalized position of such forms of labor under Fordism was itself symptomatic of Fordist labor law and the Fordist organization of production. Conceptions that in many respects were already embedded in Marx's labor theory of value and which continue to shape conventional understandings of what labor is. Fordism not only established a very clear dividing line between the home and the workspace, productive and reproductive labor, it also sought to manage various forms of workplace risk in the form of occupational health and safety, collective accident insurance, workers' compensation, social insurance, and welfare. The two forms of labor we were analyzing were immediately cast as marginal to the norm of Fordist labor. Assisted reproductive labor involves the production and circulation of reproductive services outside the space of the home, a practice that perhaps finds its most obvious precursor in the history of wet nursing and milk banks. The labor of human research subjects involves systematic exposure to the risks of new medical treatments, risks that cannot be mitigated or insured against in any simple way in the form of workers' compensation, for example. So in a sense, the fact that clinical labor was not considered a form of labor in any conventional or even legal sense of the term became itself an object of inquiry for us. What we have pursued, if you like, is a history of informal or extra legal forms of labor, the kinds of labor that Marx relegated to the margins of the labor theory of value, and which he nevertheless theorized under the rubric of the reserve army of labor or surplus population. What is interesting to us is that under post... Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> what is interesting to us is that under post fordist conditions, clinical labor has, in a certain respect, lost its exceptional status. post fordism no longer respects the boundaries between formal productive work and informal reproductive work. It takes all kinds of reproductive processes and puts them into circulation outside of the home. In a similar way, risk exposure has become the generic condition of labor under post fortis conditions, where increasing numbers of workers are not covered by social insurance mechanisms, such as workers' compensation, health insurance, or social security. Clinical labor remains an extreme case in the sense that it enacts these processes within the biological body. But it nevertheless shares much in common in structural terms with other forms of post fortist labor. In a certain respect then, we are arguing that clinical labor has moved from a position of exceptionalism to one of exemplarity. Um, but before returning to this question and trying to justify it, um, I'd like to give you a more concrete overview of um, the market in assisted reproductive labor as it exists today transnationally. Um, I'm going to use the terminology ART for assisted reproductive technologies. <laughs> 
Today, ART clinics in many parts of the world transact assisted reproductive labor, including gestational surrogacy services and the sale of oocytes across borders, procuring services from young women in one location and selling them to older or infertile women in another location. Different nations have adopted widely varying approaches to the regulation of donor-assisted conception, ranging from complete prohibition, as in Germany, through strict gift-based regulation and compensation models, as in the UK, to a total absence of regulation. The consequent patchwork nature of national and provincial regulation creates distinctive geographies of permission and prohibition so that in intending parents may elude national regulatory restrictions and travel to a jurisdiction where oocyte or surrogacy markets are permitted. A significant proportion of fertility tourists travel because forms of reproductive labor are unavailable or unaffordable at home. The average price of oocytes in the United States is around $10,000 while gestational surrogates are paid fees ranging from 20,000 to 30,000 US dollars. While the unregulated reproductive market in some US states has made it a primary destination for fertility tourists, new fertility outsource outsourcing centers are emerging, most notably in India and Southern Europe, often in direct price competition with the United States. High costs at home are also seeing US res residents travel to clinics in less expensive locations. Unlike commercial sperm production, commercial oocyte exchange involves extensive hormonal and cl clinical intervention in the vendor's body to change its reproductive rates and rhythms. This is hard work and often a high risk work. The vendor's biology is effectively altered in the interests of the purchase purchases biology to coordinate the reproduction schedule with the intending mother's cycle. The medical procedures are intensive. To achieve ovarian stimulation, the woman must subscribe to a complex daily hormonal drug regime. The process is in effect an artificially induced brief menopause, often including hot flushes and other symptoms. The next stage involves a daily or sometimes twice daily administration of hormones that lasts approximately two weeks. And then the extraction of oocytes takes place in day surgery using sedation. Um, this is quite a high risk uh, procedure. There's not only the risk of um, ovarian hyperstimulation, but also um, kidney failure, and um, in some cases it can be fatal. So it's very different um, from the sale of sperms in, in, in the sense that um, it, it's both an enduring, um, um, very intensive, physically invasive, and high-risk form of labor. Um, I turn now to the, the European oocytes market. The geography of the European oocyte market, broadly speaking, involves purchases from the north and west traveling to procurement clinics in the south and the east. Countries with the most restrictive approach to oocyte donation cluster in Northern Europe, Germany, France, the Netherlands, Sweden, while those with liberal approaches, particularly to compensation, are Spain and the Czech Republic, and outside the EU, Russia, the Ukraine, and Cyprus. The exception to this North European pattern is the UK, which has a comparatively liberal approach to oocyte donation, yet generates a considerable number of fertility tourists because of restrictions on donor compensation and the requirement of non-anonymity. Spain is at the forefront of European oocyte procurement, largely because of a specific history of liberal regulation of fertility medicine. The beginnings of IVF in Spain in the mid-1980s coincided with a wave of post-Franco liberal legislative reform around reproduction, family law, and women's rights. This absence of regulation has created the conditions for a proliferation of clinics and the flourishing of an entrepreneurial private fertility industry. There are around 300 clinics operating in Spain, 90% private, clustered along the Mediterranean coast in tourist sites or near airports offering cheap flights. In principle, Spain conforms to European legislation 
prohibiting the sale of oocytes. Gamete donation must be voluntary, gratuitous, and anon anonymous. Donors may be compensated, but not paid a wage. In practice, however, compensation is set at relatively high levels. Fees for donors range from 900 to 1,200 euros, a relatively substantial figure when compared to the 250 pounds paid until recently in the United Kingdom. And these clinics recruit amongst two primary vendor populations. The first is Spanish and international college students um, who are trying to meet living costs and tuition fees. The second is migrants from Latin America and Eastern Europe working in agriculture or domestic service. The post-Franco Spanish state has actively encouraged Spanish citizens to recruit female workers from the former Eastern Bloc and from Spain's old empire to provide domestic service and care for the children and elderly, offering regular, regular amnesties to undocumented workers and the possibility of citizenship, for example. So for these migrant care workers, oocyte vending offers an intermittent source of additional undocumented funds. Okay. Um, in the Czech Republic, compensation rates are set at around 600 euros, an amount that represents between two and three months' salary for a woman working in the service sector. East European women are considered highly desirable recruits for clinics because their oocytes are in high demand by North European purchasers. The significant involvement of young women from Eastern Europe, both in the EU oocyte centers such as Spain and the Czech Republic, but also in clinics in Russia and the Ukraine, speaks to the relationship between economic insecurity and assisted reproductive labor. The end of state socialism saw extensive unemployment across the former Eastern Bloc, but women have been disproportionately excluded from new employment in the expanding private sector and remain more likely to be unemployed or crowded into a shrinking public sector with poor salaries. Hence, women are increasingly involved in informal economic activity as the old Soviet era black markets expand into the entrepreneurial space created by marketization. These disparities propel many young women into forms of self-capitalization, such as oocyte vending. The European oocyte market is also an effect of a broader reorganization of reproduction in the region, changing relationships between states, markets, and household formation. On the one hand, the transition from state socialism in Eastern Europe has involved the abrupt desubsidization of reproduction. Former state services for childcare and healthcare have been withdrawn or privatized. On the other hand, in Western Europe, the mass movement of women out of the home and into professional and service work has seen a corresponding demand for assistance with childcare and domestic duties since the 1980s. While the Nordic states publicly fund childcare and maternity leave, others, like the Netherlands, Spain, and France, subsidize private care and migration policies that facilitate the employment of nannies, au pairs, and cleaners in the household. These transformations of the household reproduction have seen the mass importation of care labor from Eastern Europe to Western, Southern, and Northern Europe. I'm just wondering, do I have time for the India section now? Am I behind time? Should I skip? Should I skip? Try to, okay. Um, I'm moving on to the Indian gestational surrogacy market just to give you a sense of the transnationalism of these markets, but I'm, I'm going to try to compress a little before I return to the conceptual issues. Okay, so the Indian business model um, in surrogacy relies on the fact that commissioning parents can utilize Indian women to reproduce their genetic child, or at least a child with their skin color, without leaving a trace of the gestational mother's appearance. Thus, while one transnational market for Indian surrogates has emerged for non-resident Indians, another has emerged for fair-skinned North American or European couples. Okay, the women who undertake this work receive a fee that amounts to between five and seven times their usual annual household income. 
In the normal course of events, their labor power has little value and then their husbands are likely to move between a variety of low-paid jobs without statutory protections and without ever gaining access to income beyond day-to-day -day subsistence and habitual indebtedness. So gestational surrogacy as a business model positions them in a quite different market and set of transactional relations from those found in the local village. By becoming a surrogate, the woman takes on an entrepreneurial economic role, but in this case, her collateral is her own body. The expansion of the gestational surrogacy sector in India can be located in a more general move to offshore service provision in the Indian economy. Service outsourcing has effectively become the Indian national develop development model, inserting Indian labor into offshore components of the IT, communications, and pharmaceutical industries. As signatory to the World Trade Organization, India is also party to the General Agreement on Trade and Services, the multilateral agreement that governs and facilitates the international exchange of service labor. Trade in health services is rapidly develop developing as a lucrative form of labor-intensive exchange in South and East Asia, um, attracting international investment and generating spin-offs, spin notably in medical tourism. As part of its GATS negotiations, sectors of the Indian state have actively promoted an economic and regulatory climate favorable to the development of an offshore medical sector and a medical tourism market. The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, for example, encourages hospitals and clinics to market their services to international clients, and hospitals increasingly rely on revenues from international patient fees as public sector funding for health, uh, public sector funding for health is withdrawn. Within GATT's definition of international health services, fertility tourism falls under consumption abroad, grouped together with other kinds of cross-border patient travel in pursuit of affordable care or services unavailable at home. So you can see this double movement whereby uh, patients who can't afford um, fertility treatments in the States move offshore, but at the same time, the Indian state is um, offsetting the, de the decline or co almost complete disappearance of anything resembling a welfare state uh, by privatizing its medical sector in the service of uh, foreign tur medical tourists. Now I'd like to turn to a more general discussion of the place of assisted reproductive labor within the wider context of the post forward service economy. The rise of human assisted reproduction cannot be understood as a simple or inevitable effect of technical innovation. Rather, it is synchronous with and symptomatic of the dramatic shifts at the interface between the household and the labor market which took place during the 1960s and 1970s. Silvia Federici is one of the theorists who has extended the autonomous analysis of the post-Fordist transition to argue that the crisis of Fordism was also, and perhaps emblematically, a crisis of the Fordist household, with its close connection to the Keynesian welfare state and the family wage. When white women exited the Fordist household en masse to join the paid labor force during the late 1960s, Post-Fordism put the private to work, newly restructuring the labor market around services that were once performed as unpaid work in the private space of the home. In the case of the United States, the crisis of the Fordist sexual division of labor was also a crisis of the racial di division of reproductive labor within the home. During the 1960s and 70s, unprecedented numbers of African-American women left their positions as paid household labor in white homes, progressively reducing the gap between their own and white women's wages as they moved into better paid clerical and white collar jobs. So what we now call the service economy was the result of this double movement of flight. Post-Fordism internalized the crisis of the Fordist household by integrating women into a stratified service economy and placing contract service labor at the very heart of its regime of accumulation. At stake in the transition from Fordism um, to post-Fordism 
is not only the vertical disintegration of national production and a large corporation then, but also, and perhaps most significantly, the vertical disintegration of the Fordist household. As a result of this disintegration, the internal labor force of the Fordist family, including the unpaid housewife, live-in or semi-permanent domestics, um, this internal labor force has been supplanted by various horizontal contracts for service. These contracts include the traditional re reproductive services of cleaning, childcare, food preparation, etc., but also extend to the new technically mediated reproductive services enabled by assisted reproductive technologies. It is in this sense then that we have argued that assisted reproductive labor is exemplary of the general contractualization of reproductive work under post fortis conditions. In the case of these new reproductive technologies, it is the actual biological elements and moments of reproduction that have been fragmented into a suite of personal services that can be performed by independent con contractors outside the legal unit of the family. It is now possible to outsource discrete moments of the reproductive process to independent contractors beyond the legal space of both the family and the, and the nation without undermining the legal entity that is the post-Fordist family. And I think that last point um, is crucial. Because again, it must be stressed that this is not merely a social and technological phenomenon, but also the result of quite decisive shifts in the legal regulation of the family and reproduction. The creation of a market in assisted reproductive contracts would be unthinkable without a four-decade-long four trend toward the privatization of family law a trend that has tended to replace the state-imposed civil contract of marriage and state regulation of parent-child relationships with a system of private contractual relations indistinguishable from any kind of contract in service, in fact, contract for service. This trend is by no means complete, homogenous, or irreversible, but it has, at least in certain states, created the legal conditions under which kinship relations can be outsourced and contractualized beyond the traditional space of the legal family unit. At the very same time, and I think this point is crucial, the jurisprudence around ART has also been one of the sites where we have seen the most intensive efforts to redefine and re-legislate the proper form of the family that is, the proper form of genealogy, inheritance, descent, and succession. And in light of this, I would like to suggest that the specificity of reproductive labor in general lies in the fact uh, that it resides at the intersection of work and the family, at the intersection, that is, of two bodies of law, at the intersection of contract and family law. So in this sense, the task of a critical feminist Marxist politics must be to challenge both the legal forms of labor and the legal forms of the family. Thank you. Wir dachten nur, dass es jetzt schön wäre, auch Melinda erstmal noch die Möglichkeit zu geben, ihren spezifischen Blick auf Reproduktionsverhältnisse, gerade im Kontext eben von Reproduktionstechnologien, noch mal etwas zu erläutern. Und wir fanden dort sozusagen in der Vorbereitung ihre Überlegungen oder ihre These erstmal sehr spannend, zu sagen, dass die von Frauen verübten Tätigkeiten im Kontext der Reproduktionsmedizin, also von der Eizellspende bis zur Leihmutterschaft, als eine Form der reproduktiven Arbeit auf den Begriff gebracht werden müssten. Es sich also zum Beispiel bei der Zirkulation von Eizellen nicht einfach um ein Verhältnis von Spenderinnen und Empfängerinnen handelt, das also lediglich Fragen der Bioethik oder auch des äh, Vertragsrechts tangieren würde, ähm, sondern um eine ökonomisch relevante Arbeitsbeziehung, die Melinda ähm, darüber hinaus heute ähm, als exemplarisch für Formen der Kommodifizierung von Reproduktionsarbeit und Körpern 
im Postfordismus theoretisiert. Ähm, wir würden dich, Melinda, an dieser Stelle allerdings äh, gerne noch mal bitten, deine Verwendung des Begriffs der Reproduktionsarbeit noch etwas genauer zu pointieren. Denn du sagst ja, dass das Charakteristische der neuen Reproduktionstechnologien darin zu sehen sei, dass die eigentlich biologischen Aspekte der Reproduktion, also von der Produktion der Gameten, ähm, also Eizellen und, und Spermien, äh, über die Befruchtung bis zur Schwangerschaft und Geburt, dass äh, diese biologischen Aspekte der Reproduktion ähm, zunehmend verrechtlicht werden und als eine Art informelles Arbeitsdienstleistungsverhältnis kommerzialisiert wird. Damit rückst du zugleich also die körperlichen Dimensionen des Arbeitsverhältnisses, also hier der reproduktiven Arbeit, in den Mittelpunkt. Das heißt, der Begriff der Reproduktionsarbeit scheint dadurch konzeptuell untrennbar an den natürlichen Körper von Frauen, also eine beinahe als natürlich angenommene Produktivität des weiblichen Körpers ähm, geknüpft, gekoppelt zu werden. Und wir haben uns da gefragt, ob hier nicht auch die Gefahr einer Rebiologisierung von äh, Reproduktionsarbeit liegen könnte. Also warum ist es für dich ähm, ausgerechnet ähm, sinnvoll, ähm, die Betonung hier auf die körperlich-biologische Dimension von äh, Eizellgabe oder Leihmutterschaft zu legen, um diese dann als eine Form der Reproduktionsarbeit ähm, zu theoretisieren? Um, firstly, thank you very much for these questions. I firstly, I firstly want to point out that um, it's very difficult to think of any form of labor that does not in some sense mobilize, harness, or channel the capacities of the living, living human body. I'm sure I've used the word biological labor, but I shouldn't. It's um, biomedical labor or biologically mediated labor. So in this respect, I think all labor is biologically mediated. It would be possible and instructive to retrace a history of the relationship between the natural and biological sciences and the organization of labor, to detect the ways in which, in which the categories of the biological and the productive have shifted in relation to dominant forms of organization. Theorists of values such as Isaac Rubin and Moshe Postone want to divorce Marx's theory of value or time from the specific instantiations of labor that mark any given epoch. And I'm very much in sympathy, in sympathy with their focus on the social relations of labor. And yet, I don't think the abstract categories of Marx's theory of value can be so easily divorced from the biotechnical conditions of labor that characterize the late 19th century. The distinctions between dead and living labor, constant and variable capital, for example, um, so central to Marx's analysis, depend on the assumption that the technical or machinic composition of capital is inorganic and inanimate, is dead. Um, this changes, however, in the course of the 20th century, uh, where we see the development of living technologies. Mid-20th century developments in biomedicine fundamentally challenge Marx's assumption about the difference between the technological and the biological by bringing the labor process inside the body, bringing the technical process inside the body, and um, by extracting living commodities from the body. So the commodity is no longer dead labor. It's extracted, alienated from the body, and yet it's animate. So with the rise of assisted animal reproduction and mass experiment in the mid-20th century, the reproductive and metabolic cycles of living biology come to be mobilized in the service, in the service of surplus value accumulation. Um, so biology itself is technically reinvented at the same time as the form and temporalities of uh, value. However, it's true that ARTs draw on the reproductive biology of women in ways that starkly reassert the connection between, between women's work and the reproductive. And although men perform assisted reproductive labor also, notably as sellers of their sperm 
Here too, we find a starkly gendered division of labor in the ways in which such services are organized. Sven Bergman, a researcher here in Berlin, um, who has worked on Spanish uh, 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 clinics, has pointed to the heteronormative pornographic imagery, imaginary that governs sperm and egg extraction clinics in places such as Spain, where the male reproductive a uh, worker, whether heterosexual or homosexual, is hypersexualized and treated as a kind of porn star stud, whereas the organization of egg extraction demands an intense experience of bodily passivity and depends heavily on ideas of maternal gifting and generosity, even amongst women who are simply selling their eggs. So even as post-Fordism disaggregates and deterritorializes the classic scenario of uh, sexual reproduction. Transactional reproductive labor reestablishes a clear division of labor between a masculine, a masculine economy of excess pleasure and hypersexuality and a female economy of maternal sacrifice. So this much is undeniable. However, my approach to these questions is analytic and diagnostic, not normative. I'm interested in dissecting and critiquing what I take to be an already existing labor relation, not endorsing or celebrating it. In order to undertake this critical task, it is necessary, at the least, to acknowledge that the sale of assisted reproductive services already constitutes a labor market in the sense that it is indistinguishable, indistinguishable in its legal and social components from other sectors of informal service labor in the post-Fordist economy. However, I emphatically do not want to claim special recognition for women's reproductive labor as somehow emblematic of women's specific economic contribution or to valorize it as some essential use, use value foundational to the production of economic value in general. And I think that this, this kind of argument, this kind of tendency is implicit in a certain strand of feminist theory, um, particularly of an eco-feminist inspiration. Um, one example that comes to mind um, is Vandana Shiva, who um, performs this slippage between woman, seed, and reproduction in her analysis of uh, reproductive labor in India. It seems to me that the task of a critical feminist politics is to displace rather than entrench existing sexual and racial divisions of labor. I'm therefore very critical of a politics of recognition that seeks to make visible or valorize women's contribution to the production of economic value as an end in itself. Na, weil also Melinda's Analyse natürlich auch um, einhergeht mit bestimmten politischen Konsequenzen. Ähm, konkreter gesagt, die assistierte Reproduktion als eine ähm, informelle Form ähm, von Arbeit auf den Begriff zu bringen, ähm, legt auch bestimmte politische Interventionen nahe, ähm, in dieses Feld sozusagen zu, ähm, einzugreifen. Wenn wir etwa die Eizellspende nicht mehr als altruistische Gabe verstehen, sondern als Warentausch, dem eine Entäußerung von Arbeit zugrunde liegt, dann folgt daraus her, dass die Spenderin zur Arbeiterin wird und aus der Aufwands Aufwandsentschädigung ähm, entsprechend auch einen Lohn zu werden hat. Äh, so verstehen wir zumindest ähm, auch euren Einsatz. Ähm, die reproduktiven Arbeiterinnen werden auf dieser Basis, Basis, ähnlich wie wir das im Bereich der Sexarbeit ähm, kennen und es da diskutiert wurde, mit einem größeren Handlungsvermögen ausgestattet, wo also eine angestrebte rechtliche Reglementierung der Eizellspende zum Beispiel die Eizellgeberin noch individualisiert. Da werden durch die Anerkennung der Eizellgabe als Arbeit kollektive Handlungsformen, das heißt Arbeitskämpfe denkbar, die auf bessere Bezahlung, bessere Arbeitsbedingungen, besseren Schutz vor Arbeitsrisiken und so weiter abzielen. Wir fragen uns hierbei allerdings, inwieweit eine solche Strategie andere Strategien möglicherweise untergräbt, die vielleicht ein bisschen vorher ansetzen und aus guten Gründen gegen die zunehmende Kommodifizierung von Körpern und Körpermaterialien 
argumentieren. Nehmen wir diese Kommodifizierung nicht schon als unwiederbringlich ähm, hin oder treiben sie womöglich sogar mit voran, wenn wir die assistierte Reproduktion als eine Arbeitsform gewissermaßen normalisieren? Diese Frage wird zusätzlich relevant, wenn wir uns über globale Strategien im Umgang mit der Reproduktionsökonomie verständigen wollen. So ist in einigen Ländern wie hier in Deutschland ja die Eizellspende noch gar nicht ähm, legalisiert, in anderen aber bereits geduldet und damit als informeller Arbeitsmarkt auch existent. Während da, äh, werden da jetzt sozusagen überspitzt formuliert, Forderungen nach einer Entkommodifizierung ähm, nicht viel eher ein gemeinsamer möglicher Nenner für feministische Politik als die Forderung nach Anerkennung der Eizellgabe als Lohnarbeit. Thank you. Um, so in response to your question, I think it needs to be pointed out um, that the principled posi position against the commodif commodification of the body is already hegemonic. So unique amongst all other forms of commercial transaction, biomedical services fall under the discursive jurisdiction of bioethics, an immensely powerful regulatory apparatus which insists that reproductive services should not be treated as labor and that therefore they should uh, attract certain limited forms of compensation um, but not in any case a wage, a wage determined by competitive free market conditions. Um, what has happened in practice is that such prohibitions have not prevented the flourishing of labor markets in reproductive services. Instead, limits on such services in the UK or Northern Europe have served to create the conditions for semi-regulated or unregulated markets in Southern and Eastern Europe. So one does not counter capitalist labor relations by outlawing so certain forms of labor. As the cases of both prostitution and reproductive labor have made clear, a politics of prohibition only serves to create semi-regulated or clandestine spaces that predictably draw on the labor of undocumented workers. I'm also uncomfortable with the idea that one would want to, want to prohibit the so-called commodification of the body, given that all labor relations depend on the commodification of labor power, which resides in the body of the worker. It is true that different kinds of labor demand more or less mediated and more or less intensive, higher risk or visceral forms of bodily investment. So professional high paid labor tends to be the least physically exhausting and the least physically invasive. Although personally, I would never use the term um, that Negri and Hart propose of immaterial labor to describe the grueling routines of high tech work. The technically mediated forms of biomedical work that myself and Kathy have analyzed in the book Clinical Labor certainly involve an intensely visceral and invasive deployment of the body. But can we say that these forms of labor are any more physically demanding than the labor of the miner or the construction worker? It's interesting um, to me that one does not hear the same horror or the same critique of commodification in relation to such traditional forms of industrial labor, which continue to have very high um, injury and death rates. Which leads me to wonder, is it the intensely invasive, physically internal nature of assisted reproductive labor, similar to prostitution, that sets it apart? Is it this that sets it apart and identifies it as a peculiar degrading form of commodification? Or is it the fact that both assisted reproductive labor and sex work alienate the reproductive from the space of the family? And I think it's here that the judgment of commodification um, kicks in. You hear, um, I mean, um, in principle, uh, one should feel the same horror at um, gifted forms of um, donor-assisted conception, but one does not. It's when the transaction takes place within 
a contractor who is external to the family, and in some, in some respects um, represents a threat to the family in much the same way that the, the prostitute does. So it seems to me that the critique of commodification, um, which seems to focus in particular on certain forms of women's labor and certain forms of female reproductive labor that do not take place in the home, are informed by a highly questionable moral economy. And that again, what is at stake here is the tension that I think is definitive of reproductive labor uh, between uh, the family and the, the space of work, the market and the family um, contract and family law. <clears throat> 